The English language is full of plenty of words with fascinating backstories. But today, I'm going to be talking to you guys about that word itself. Guy. Something I say a lot as an American from, well, not the South. Or Pittsburgh. And with that said, it seems that with the rise of social media, English speakers all over the world are using this word more frequently, especially the term you guys to refer to many people. So what is it with this word, guy? Where did it come from? How did it become what it is today? These types of questions are why this one word is so interesting. That's in part because this is a story of religion, terrorism, politics, holidays, war, poverty, art, grammar, books, comics, George Washington, the French, children, monarchy, fear, manners, and so much more. And at the center of it all is one guy. Many words have complex backstories, but this one, this one is one of the best. So let's investigate. The word guy was introduced to the British Isles by the Norman French, that along with about 30% of the other words, the Mott and Bailey, and a disdain for French nobility, something the French it turns out would be pretty good at themselves. The word likely comes from the old High German word Wido, which is connected to meanings like wood, forest, and notably, guide. Wido was Latinized into Guido, which would become guide in French. That is where the English word for guide comes from, a word that is the origin of the name Guy. Guide, Guy. You see, it became a trendy name for Italians to give to their sons, Guido. But the hipster French took it a step further, dropped the ending, and just went with Guy, giving us intense names like Guy, Guy de Lusignan, King, King of, of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Now that guy's got a cool name and title, even if the uh, King part didn't last too long. But the Brits took notes, and subsequently the Americans, who on the other hand gave us names like Guy Fieri, Mayor of Flavortown. Wikipedia lists a lot of guys, despite an almost 700 year gap between most of them. But the guy this story centers around is none other than the 1600s very own Guy Fox. Many may know him from the Guy Fox masks, popularized by the movie V for Vendetta and the group Anonymous. And though that is quite the cultural legacy, that is not his first mark or his biggest. That's because the reason we say Guy today is in part thanks to this guy. So let's take a closer look at Guy Fox and his significance. Because why did people choose to remember what he did for so long? Guy Fox's first name was seemingly uncommon for the time. Though he was born in the same county, Yorkshire, as a then recent and locally well-known guy, Guy Fairfax, a man who would rise to become a chief justice, which could very well be where Fox's first name came from. When Guy Fox was around eight years old, his father died, a man who worked for the Anglican Church. Guy's mother would later remarry a man who himself was a recusant, someone who maintained their Catholic faith during the rise of the Anglican Church in Britain, despite potential fines, persecution, and prosecution. Guy's stepfather, a Dennis Bainbridge, would apparently impact Guy's life greatly, conditioning his zeal. Guy himself would convert to Catholicism as a teenager. Guy Fox would later become a military man at the age of 21, after difficulties maintaining employment in England. Huh, well, I guess things never change. He would move to the Netherlands to fight alongside the Spanish in the Dutch War of Independence, which was strongly influenced by a struggle between Calvinists and Catholics. Calvinism being a unique offshoot of the greater Protestant movement. Guy would become quite successful, even being recommended for the position of captain in the Spanish military. After failing to convince the ruler of Spain, Felipe III, to help English Catholics depose the new Anglican leader of a united England and Scotland, James VI and I. One person, two numbers. Welcome to this week's episode of England and Scotland trying to work together. Guy would return to the Netherlands and would be introduced to a Thomas Wintour in Flanders. 
Thomas, sent there to look for help and having multiple setbacks, would recruit Guy in a plot to kill James, a plot involving blowing up part of the Palace of Westminster, aka the Houses of Parliament, with gunpowder. Gunpowder being something military man Guy Fox was quite knowledgeable about, and taking out the Protestant monarch in Britain being something he wanted. Guy agreed and headed off to England to join what would become known as the Gunpowder Plot. The reasons for this planned attack were brought upon by the hopelessness of English Catholics. James at first was quite lenient with them, leaving them be for the most part, especially compared to his predecessor Elizabeth post-excommunication. Funny how that changes someone. But once more aggressive members of the government found out, they placed the expectation on James that he would go after them more. So he did. It would be this continued discrimination that further radicalized and emboldened a handful of Catholics, which is an interesting matter on its own. Long story short, this group of men under the leadership of Robert Catesby would purchase small amounts of gunpowder at a time as to not arouse suspicion, enough to create a large, deadly explosion. They would save up to 36 barrels worth of powder to be detonated under the House of Lords in Parliament while it was packed full of members of the government, including James. The gunpowder would have been capable of an explosion similar to what can be seen in this recreation, with a mock-up of the chamber the members would have been in within Westminster itself. No doubt, it probably would have been quite effective. Delays would happen, and a few more people would join the gunpowder plot, and of this group, it is assumed one of them would be the person who reached out to a Catholic member of the House of Lords, a William Parker, telling him not to attend the gathering at Parliament that was a few days away, implying an attack. Parker would pass on the letter to fellow lords, who did a search of Westminster and found nothing. Because of this, Catesby thought it would still be safe to follow through, despite some members wanting to call off the attack. The gunpowder was still well hidden in his view. When the letter made its way to James after returning from a trip, keywords indicating an explosion alerted him, so he organized another search. Deep into the night of the 4th or 5th of November, some of James' men would run into Guy Fox during the search, and it was all over. Guy would be tortured using a rack to get the name of other conspirators. It was severe enough to be seen in his signature, allegedly fainting while writing it the second time after the torture. Interestingly, Guy would change his name to Guido while he was abroad going as far as to sign his name as it. Maybe this Latinization was a reflection of his Catholic faith, a rejection of English culture, and or maybe because it was trendy to Latinize one's name. Though it may have just been because he was hanging out with the Spanish for so long. They do say words cool. Guy would die just before his execution by what is assumed to have been a self-inflicted neck breaking, probably to avoid being hanged, drawn, and quartered. Not a fun way to go, and would make an Aztec sacrifice look like a tea party. That said, Parliament and the public would not let Guy Fox get away so easily, and that is an important point. As it would turn out, this failed terrorist attack would have disastrous consequences for English Catholics over the coming centuries. In the eyes of the government, their potential dangers had been realized, and Guy would be used as a tool of propaganda for this. Despite not being the ringleader of the gunpowder plot, that was Catesby, Guy Fawkes would have the day come to center around his own personal involvement. And with it, his name would remain in the minds of almost everybody part of the greater British culture. For the year following the attack, Parliament would establish a holiday originally called Gunpowder Treason Day, which is definitely not a catchy name, they should have workshopped that more. The holiday fit neatly alongside harvest festivals that occurred around the same time, where bonfires were common. Bonfire coming from Middle English meaning a fire of bones, where people would burn off leftovers and waste from harvest season feasts, including bones and such. And unsurprisingly, bonfires would become a massive part of Gunpowder Treason Day, even becoming one of its modern day names, Bonfire Night. Over the 1600s, the holiday would slowly spread around the island. The idea of overcoming a Catholic takeover and the attempt on James's life, the rightful ruler of Protestant Britain, would dominate the early holiday. It was just one more thing to celebrate during already occurring festivities, with enough drama occurring at the time for people to adopt it and keep bringing it up each year. Why? Throughout the century, Britain would undergo its own equivalent to the Red Scare, fearing many Catholic takeovers and conspiracies fueled by simultaneous instability with the monarchy. James's son, Charles, who inherited the throne, would marry a Catholic woman who would not become Anglican, while in an effort to build ties with Catholic France, well, before he was killed by Oliver Cromwell. 
When Oliver Cromwell died, his son would resign from the position of Lord Protector within a year after his father's death. At that point, Charles II would take over, and he would actually convert to Catholicism on his deathbed. Having no legitimate children with Catherine, who herself remained Catholic, Charles II's brother, James II, would take the throne. And being an openly Catholic man, having a son to pass the crown onto, and putting many Catholics into government offices, he was deposed and then replaced by William of Orange from the Netherlands and his own daughter, Mary, both Protestants all with the support of quite a large number of government leaders. Salt in the wound for Mr. Fox, who fought over there almost a century ago. James II would actually try to ban bonfires while he was in charge, which did not make a lot of people happy. When William took over, his birthday just so happened to be on November the 4th. So he, a man seen as the defender of Protestant Britain, a liberator, would bring back the bonfires and dial up the state's view on the holiday's importance. Leave it to the Dutch to know how to party. At the turn of the century, Gunpowder Treason Day would still be about anti-Catholic propaganda, but would slowly become less about James not being killed, and more about burning effigies, fire, and making fun of Catholics. Statues of the Pope would often be burned, alongside occasional pagan gods, an unpopular politician or two, oh, and a Guy Fox once in a blue moon. 1742 is the earliest date we have evidence of the Guy Fox remember rhyme, and it doesn't even mention Guy's name but it does talk about taking bonfires away. Fair warning, never try to take a Brit's fire away. They don't forget that stuff and they write poems about it. It's a nightmare. But this shift in tone would lead the holiday to be called Pope Day or Pope Night by a large number of people. The holiday, once popular in the United States, would die off not long after independence. With George Washington himself during the war pushing to ban it in the army as to not offend Catholics from Canada or Maryland who may want to or were helping the cause. He saw burning idols of the Pope as childish and offensive to others. And no doubt it would have been weird to celebrate a holiday rooted in the safety of a monarchy from a nation they were fighting against. The idea of the monarchy was becoming less significant for the holiday. So much so that people fighting the monarchy were also celebrating a holiday day rooted in its survival, at least for a time, and Washington himself was public about offending Catholics, not so much about the monarchy part. In the end, Pope Knight would die out, and with it conditioning Halloween to grow in popularity in the United States instead, post-independence. Towards the end of the century, the upper classes would slowly stop caring about the holiday as much, including people like Washington stateside. In return, the holiday would slowly become less about sticking it to the Pope and more about the excitement, as the narrative became less controlled and focused throughout Britain. Now, when an issue with Catholics did pop up, the burning of statues representing them almost certainly would have happened. But the Regency, wars, massive population growth, and a huge number of people that were in poverty, that would leave a mark. The holiday was changing again, and sometimes even just regionally, as the lower classes came to mostly celebrate the holiday. Slowly, Guy Fawkes effigies would come to dominate the scene, so much so that people started calling the holiday Guy Fawkes Day, which has lasted all the way up to today, and overtook Pope Day or Night. Children, who often did a lot of the prep work for the holiday, would start to make Guy Fawkes effigies out of simple materials, often intentionally looking as ridiculous as possible, to ultimately beg for money with, and later, throw in fires. The money part worked, and with so many poor children, it was a little way for them to make some money, which is probably why it caught on so fast, and with it, steering the holiday. A penny for the guy, they would chant. All of this became such a big deal that cities like Liverpool would actually pass laws to prevent children from being able to beg in 1824 and 1833 because they saw these children as nuisances, because they often would hang around stores, begging for a penny for the guy, reminding some shoppers of poverty. Oh, those poor shoppers, the humanity. And here we see guy, used to refer to the effigies, dolls, statues, and so on. These are guys. The OED, Oxford English Dictionary, identifies 1806 as the earliest date they have a record of this usage of guy. The public started to have a renewed interest in Guy Fawkes, especially as those kids grew up. This interest may have been what inspired William Ainsworth to write a three-volume set titled, well, 
Guy Fox. First released throughout 1840, it would become extremely popular, even being reviewed by Edgar Allan Poe, who, well, didn't like the writing style. Nonetheless, in Professor James Sharp's book, Remember Remember, A Cultural History of Guy Fox Day, he remarks on how Ainsworth's book helped turn Guy Fox into an acceptable fictional character. And with it, Guy Fox would show up in all kinds of literature, including children's literature and penny dreadfuls, which were cheap and popular stories covering darker topics. All of this aided by increased literacy among the lower classes. Guy would become a cultural figure that people seem to enjoy as a bad, if not misunderstood, real character. Sometimes even seen as a rebel who tried to stick it to the government, a villain to them, but a hero to his cause. A legacy that would carry on all the way up to the creation of V from V for Vendetta, as discussed by V's co-creator, David Lloyd. There was a market for both fiction and non-fictional works involving Guy Fawkes, even covering his childhood throughout the 1800s. And it would mostly be within the 1800s we start to see Guy's name seep into the English language as slang, a term to refer to people often rooted in the cultural awareness around Guy Fox and the holiday. And initially, there were a number of unique definitions. One of the earliest examples was likely an extension of the crazy-looking Guy effigies, conditioning the term Guy to mean a person of eccentric appearance or dress. It was actually not even tied to gender, and this term would go as far back as 1836. Some examples throughout the 1800s being The Love Match, Miss Marge Banks, and The Mikado, which all have examples of this definition, referring to men and women by both female and male authors. It would be about a decade later when we start to see the term guy used to refer to any generic male, with one of the earliest examples being from a publication from 1847, a book for locating pubs and bars where a lonely man can find, um... Some company. Yeah, company. We'll go with that. Now, this usage of guy is simply the earliest example, and not necessarily the setting in which the definition originates. It's likely these early examples were in reference to the outrageous looking effigies, used to strike up a particular image of the person. A guy was an odd fellow, and not necessarily a flattering term. But this form of the word in some way would last all the way up to today with a loss of that imagery which we'll get back to. The holiday would keep changing, and it soon became associated with rioting, unrest, and disobedience, and along with it, the term guy to some degree. Some gangs would actually call themselves guys as they terrorize people. Starting around the 1850s, a group known as the Guildford Guys would start causing riots, robberies, and damage all over the course of a decade and a half every Guy Fox day. They would build quite a reputation for themselves, and within their early years, we start to see a new definition for the term guy, meaning to make fun of or ridicule someone. If you were guying or guyed, someone was not having a fun time. Widespread unrest during Guy Fox Day would actually lead Parliament in 1859 to repeal their observation of the holiday. A dramatic increase in policing would bring most Guildford Guy activity to an end around 1863. The same year, the hit book Hard Cash came out, talking about mistreatment in British insane asylums, a book that would also become popular in the US. It would show the usage of terms like poor little guy, a notable shift in tone the word was often used in. Mark Twain would actually go on to be a notable early American adopter of the term guy. He would actually use the word in a number of different contexts with different definitions starting around the 1870s on. Examples include a way to refer to men with that up to no good imagery, as well as using it to talk about people ridiculing people. Guy as a synonym to refer to both a person and people also started around the 1870s. It would be within this context we start to see the rise of the term you guys as a way to refer to a bunch of people, a second person plural. Guy's early legacy as non-gendered likely aiding in this usage. Now, it should be said that these were kind of niche words early on, terms that could be better understood when someone knew about the cultural context behind them. In places like the UK, Guy would surely draw back that imagery of Guy Fox and negative and or rough connotations. But in the United States, a place that no longer practiced Guy Fox Day, Guy did not really have all that cultural imagery or cultural baggage. Thus, it was a new and neat little word to refer to men or a bunch of people that wasn't so formal. And here is where its popularity would grow, starting mostly in the 1890s as a slang word used in particular areas around the United States 
by poorer youth. And likely because of this, from around the 1890s on, we start to see these new words in America pop up incorporating the word guy into them. Examples being wise guy, fall guy, bad guy, good guy with the latter two becoming extremely popular terms throughout the entirety of the English-speaking world. Terms that can also be applied to any person. This leads us to the next big milestone in the history of Guy. Here we have a man of the name Reuben, aka Rube Goldberg. San Francisco native born in 1883, he was a 90s kid. Well, 1890s. He would go to college to become an engineer, and would work as one for just six months only to quit and become a newspaper cartoonist around 1904. He would move to New York City in 1907, where he would rise to the top. By 1915, he was America's most popular cartoonist, with works like Mike and Ike, Boog McNutt, Rube Goldberg Machine Comics, which were complicated machines to do simple tasks, and his running gag catchphrase, I'm the guy, which he would use in his comics and merchandise, even writing a hit comical song with it sung by then-famous Billy Murray. One of the most famous items using this catchphrase were little pins by him that came with packets of cigarettes. His comics over the Rube Goldberg machines would continue to be influential over the 20th century, influencing works from the Looney Tunes, Wallace and Gromit, and Tom and Jerry, to educational children's programming including Sesame Street, Vision On, and The Electric Company. His influence would spread all around the English-speaking world, and with it, how he spoke to some degree. I've got lots of company, genuine inventors, guys who've got their stuff protected by the United States Patent Office. He was important, though he wasn't alone. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. By the 1920s, Guy would have a foothold in American literature. And by the 1930s, it was showing up in massively influential American literary works and movies, meaning both a man and a person. Great and influential American authors like John Steinbeck and Dashiell Hammett would frequently use Guy when it was uncommon for other popular authors to use it around the same time, like that of Ernest Hemingway, William Faulkner, and F. Scott Fitzgerald, though who themselves would occasionally use it in their later publications. Hammett himself notably used it in 1930 to have a woman character describe herself, and it would be his work that greatly influenced early film noir and crime genres, a place where Guy and You Guys would be heard loud and clear as sound became a standard for film. Here are some examples. And that guy will probably charge the company overtime. No, 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 I don't want that guy. I don't trust him. What's the guy look like? Well, he's about five foot ten. Weren't you ever romantic? Can you imagine a guy getting romantic in a reform school? Hmm? You're a smart guy. You'll be right back in the pen. You know you can't get away with it. I've spent all the time I want to trying to keep you guys in line. From now on, you can run things to suit yourself. And if they catch up with you, it's your grief. I'm selling out. You know, you know, that guy writes wonderful stuff. How did you pronounce his name? Francois Villon. What kind of a guy is this, Graham? Young, ambitious. What's his price? Did you ever hear the story about the virtuous young man? Someday you're going to give me one of those screwy answers and I'm going to bust you right in the nose. <laughs> Tell it to me in English. He can't be bought. Hey, Rocky, is it changed? Four and a half bucks even. And where's the order 50 cents? We had to buy something, didn't we? You guys got an awful lot to learn. Come on now, chuck your chest up to the wood. Ah, these beans are rotten. Oh, you don't like the beans? No! Now that's more like it. Mm, very pretty. Yeah. The million guys in the army, a babe like her's got to pick out a mug like him. She ain't never met. When you write to her, ask her if she has a friend. Yeah, put in having a wonderful time. Wish we were in many What do you mean, we? You look too popular for you guys? Maybe you need a heart to call you out. Ha! Move on! By at least the 1940s, the words had a clear grip on pockets throughout America, from California to New York, with it holding relatively strong throughout the 1950s. The word would start showing up in American classic after American classic, even if only briefly. Movies, books, plays, Native Son, 
The Iceman Cometh, Death of a Salesman, Catcher in the Rye, Breakfast at Tiffany's, The Invisible Man, I Robot, A Raisin in the Sun, Twelve Angry Men, and the list goes on and on. With black Americans, white Americans, women, men, people all over were using guy, even if only once at a time, using a slang word with a very deep history. And by the time we get to the late 1960s, something very, very big happened. Google Books Ngram Viewer shows the frequency of terms in books. Here we can actually look up the usage of guy and you guys. You can see it coming from nearly nothing in the 1890s to having a respectable peak in the 1940s. It would dip as it came into the 60s only to grow extremely rapidly from about 1966 onward. And the biggest thing to happen in 1966 was that the counterculture movement was in full swing, with similar movements happening all over the English-speaking world and the world itself. A vast amount of people, often baby boomers, but not exclusively, reshaping their culture and sharing it with each other. They brought this word to new heights, and with it, changing how Americans and a number of people around the English-speaking world spoke. It's by no means simply an American phenomenon. Australians, Canadians, Irish, New Zealanders, and especially Brits have all contributed to its adoption and or formation, especially as of recently, with the Spanish, Dutch, and French all having a part in it, too. Its rapid growth and popularity in the 1960s is a fascinating occurrence, conditioning the following decade, the 1970s, to open up with shows like The Electric Company, its intro proclaiming Hey you guys! Talking to everyone, talking to the youth, helping to usher in a new normal for the next generation, with them carrying it on from there. Growing and growing. But with all that said, why? Why this word? Well, it's hard to say, it just kind of worked out. It's one syllable, not formal. Its complex history made it more easily able to be used for both men and women, and that kind of made it quite handy. There was a reason we needed a word like it. And that brings us to the final part of this story, and it brings us full circle. A long time ago, during the times of Old and Middle English, the word you was only plural. There was no need for you guys. Each word in this case would have indicated the same thing. Many people. You was once complemented by the word thou, which works similar to how we use you today. Singular. For example, do thou like it? Do ye like it? I don't want to talk to thee, and I don't want to talk to you. Thy gonna like this. You're gonna like this. Is this thine, or is this yours? Nowadays, it reads more like this. All the thous replaced with you, and all the yous replaced with, well, you guys, or an equivalent. If you have only ever spoken English, this can take some time to wrap your mind around if you've never been exposed to it. It's not a problem most languages have had to deal with, and was arguably a poor move for the English language. That said, around the same time, English did get rid of almost all of its gender distinctions between words. A table doesn't need to be masculine or feminine, it just needs to be a table. So what's the context here? Well, it's a little thing called the French. They've been looming in the background this entire video. Even I am French. Les blagues sont vous tous. <laughs> In the 10 hundreds, French views around manners and politeness spread into the English upper classes, especially around the 13 hundreds. Since the Norman French conquests, every English ruler's first language was French until Henry IV. When English did become the language of the elite, some would still speak in a manner that reflected French culture of the time, instilling a TV distinction into English society. This is where one would use the plural word you, in this case, to address status, respect, and so on. That would be seen as impolite, demeaning, or too personal to use in a public setting, often only used on people of a lower class or in special circumstances. By the time we get to Elizabeth I, the excommunicated one we mentioned earlier, she was known to almost only use you. Thus, thou would die out for most of the English-speaking world, as she helped solidify the practice as good manners. People followed her and the example of the elites. Well, except the Quakers, the original hippies, but cooler. They hate them because they ain't them. 
You being both for a single person and many people was and is confusing. No one wanted to be seen as rude back then though. So almost everybody used you for all occasions and they just, as they say, suffered with it. A number of writers at the time also complained about this being a problem. So what did English speakers do? They got creative. We created regionalized pronouns for the second person plural, taking the now dominant singular you and adding something to it to indicate many people. In some places, they simply added an S after the word you, making use. What are you doing? What are yous doing? Others combined you with a word to refer to many people, like all, you all, making y'all. You come back now, y'all come back now. Some kept them separate, like you and lot, making you lot. You get out of here. You lot get out of here. There are a number of combinations all over the English-speaking world, sometimes a few in the same country, and sometimes the same one in different countries. But as fate would have it, some people would latch on to the word guy, which may very well have one of the most interesting backstories out of these examples, if not one of the most interesting backstories out of any word in English. Guy is often seen as a word to refer to just men, and has only recently included women. But that's not really the case. Women were often the earliest adopters of the term, with a large number of the widely used definitions of guy being traced back to women themselves. They helped build the term too, and at times used it on each other. The male bias is there, and reached its peak during the early half of the 1900s. Today that bias is stronger in some places than others. Where I'm from, almost nobody would bat an eye if a man or woman called a woman guy and that flexibility of the word guy definitely seems to be spreading. So with the words rise in popularity all around the world, maybe it's time to finally beat the stigma and finish what Julia Maitland helped start back in 1836. Because maybe, just maybe, we all can be a guy. So with all that said and done, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. My question for thee is, what are your thoughts on the term you guys? And should we use something else, or bring back the old terms even? Something that probably most people who can't pronounce a TH very well probably wouldn't be too happy about. <laughs> and with all that said and done, my name's Dale, this is Think Fact, and remember, never stop learning. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. That would really help me out. If you're interested, please consider supporting me on Patreon. I would really appreciate it. Hey everybody, I wanted to do a quick shout out to everybody who has supported me on Patreon, either currently or at some point. I want to say everything you all have contributed to helping me has made a very big difference in my life. So thank you very, very much. Have a good one.